so let's pick up where we left off last time with kind of our continuation with functions of <clears throat> um, that are Riemann still just integrable and we're kind of extending our ideas with step functions and so to begin this let's um, start off with a couple of theorems so theorem 7.4 from the reference what if we assume that C is going to be some point in the open interval between A and B if we've got two of the three integrals existing then the third is also going to exist so if we've got the integral from A to C of F D alpha plus the integral from C to B of F D alpha then that's going to be equal to the integral from A to B of F D alpha so let's take a look at the proof of that and see how this might go. So let's first begin by supposing that the integral from A to C of F D alpha and the integral from C to B of F D alpha are both going to exist. Well, let's begin by letting epsilon be greater than zero. And since the integral from A to C of F D alpha exists, then there exists some partition P sub epsilon of the closed interval A to C such that the distance between any Riemann sum of a partition of um, A to C of F with respect to alpha in that Riemann sum minus the integral from A to C um, of F D alpha is going to be less than epsilon over 2 for any partition that's going to be finer than P sub epsilon. Then likewise there exists some other partition P hat sub epsilon of the interval from C to B such that the distance between any Riemann still just sum um, and the integral from C to B of F D alpha that's going to be less than epsilon over 2 for any partition P prime that's going to be finer than P hat sub epsilon and so what we can do then to get um, a partition of the entire interval from A to B we can just take the union of those two partitions that we have so if we take um, Q sub epsilon to be P sub epsilon union P hat sub epsilon then if we suppose that we've got um, another partition of AB that's going to be finer than Q sub epsilon then because C is going to be an element of Q sub epsilon we have um, any refinement of that one C is also going to be element an element of the refinement and so if we take um, our refinement Q prime and intersect that with our original piece of epsilon then that's still going to be a partition of AC and furthermore that partition is going to be finer than P sub epsilon and that's going to be true since P sub epsilon is going to be contained in P sub epsilon union P hat sub epsilon but that was our Q sub epsilon and our Q sub epsilon was <clears throat> our Q prime was a refinement of that Q sub epsilon and so Q sub epsilon is going to be contained in Q prime and so what that means is that P sub epsilon is going to be contained in our Q prime intersect P sub epsilon. Now we can kind of go through similar reasoning um, to show that Q prime intersect um, P hat sub epsilon is going to be a finer partition of C of the interval from C to B um, than P hat sub epsilon. And so if we go through and actually list out what Q prime looks like, so we've got A is equal to X sub 0 less than X sub 1 all the way up to um, X sub N minus 1 less than C, so we'll assume X sub N is going to be C. Then we continue from there X sub N plus 1 all the way up to X sub N plus M um, being our right end point B. So then if we look at the Riemann, uh, Riemann still just sum, um, our sum from 1 to n plus m of f of t sub i 
delta alpha sub i, well, we can break that up into a sum over the first partition up to c, and a sum from the second partition from c on up to b. And so we can write our riemann stilgis sum as two separate riemann stilgis sums over the partitions from a to c and the partitions from c to b, respectively. So then we can actually look at the difference between our Riemann still just sum um, with respect to Q prime of F with respect to alpha and our target, the integral from A to C of FD alpha plus the integral from C to B of FD alpha. We look at that difference. We can replace our sum with sums over the partitions from A to C and the partition sum over the partition from C to B. Then kind of um, rearranging terms in there, we apply the um, triangle inequality and we can group um, our sum with the respective integral. So we've got our sum over um, our partition from A to C minus our integral from A to C of FD alpha plus um, our sum minus over sum with respect to our interval of um, from C to B minus our integral from C to B of FD alpha. Then um, by the way that we chose those partitions, we know that each one of those is going to be less than epsilon over 2. So epsilon over 2 plus epsilon over 2 just gives us epsilon. And so that gives us the conclusion that if the integrals over our subinterval, so the integral from A to C of FD alpha exists, and our integral from C to B of FD alpha exists, then if we add those together, that actually gives us the integral from A to B of F D alpha. So now if we kind of flip that around a little bit and suppose that we've got the integral from A to B of F D alpha and the integral from A to C of F D alpha, then kind of going back again, if we let epsilon be greater than zero, we've got partition P sub epsilon of the entire interval from A to B um, for which the difference between any Riemann still just sum and the integral value is going to be less than epsilon over 2 for any partition finer, p prime finer than p sub epsilon. Now likewise, um, because our integral from A to C of FD alpha exists, we've got a partition p hat sub epsilon of the closed interval A to C such that the difference between a Riemann still just sum um, and the integral from A to C of FD alpha is going to be less than epsilon over 2 for any partition p hat um, prime finer than p hat sub epsilon. So what we can do is to take a partition q sub epsilon to be p hat sub epsilon union p sub epsilon and we want to intersect that with our closed interval from c to b. Now that's going to give us a partition of our closed interval from c to b and if we let q be any partition of cb that's going to be finer than q sub q sub epsilon, then um, what we know is that p hat sub epsilon union p sub epsilon intersect um, the closed interval from a to c. We know that's going to be a partition p prime of the closed interval from a to c that's going to be finer than p hat sub epsilon. And so P prime union Q is a partition of AB that's going to be finer than P sub epsilon. So then we're just going to use this relationship again where if we've got a Riemann still just sum over a partition P prime of A to C and Q from C to B um, or from yeah from C Q from C to B, then we can break that Riemann still just sum up into um, a Riemann still just sum over the first partition P prime plus the Riemann still just sum over the second partition Q from C to B. So if we then kind of rearrange those just a little bit, 
we can get that the Riemann is still just some um, over the partition from C to B is going to be equal to our Riemann still just sum over the entire partition minus the Riemann still just sum over the partition from A up to C. And so if we kind of look at now the difference between um, our Riemann still just sum and what we think our target answer should be, which namely the integral from A to B of FD alpha minus the integral from A to C of FD alpha, we look at that difference, the absolute value of that difference, then we can um, take our sum over the um, partition from B to C and break that up as the difference over a Riemann Silger sum over the entire interval minus the Riemann Silger sum over the first half um, or the first portion of the interval from A to C. Um, kind of doing the same thing we did before. We um, rearrange terms in there. We use the triangle inequality. And what we find then is that by the way we chose those partitions that that's going to be less than epsilon over 2 plus epsilon over 2 or just epsilon and so our conclusion at that point is that our if we have the integral existing over the entire interval from a to b and the integral existing over the first portion of it from a to c then we get that the integral over the second portion from c to b exists and in fact that integral from C to B of FD alpha is going to be equal to the integral over the entire interval from A to B of FD alpha minus the integral over the first portion from A to C of FD alpha and kind of re again rearranging those terms gives us the conclusion of the theorem. So if it happens to be the case that the integral exists over the entire interval from A to B and the integral exists over the second portion, the proof is pretty similar um, to what we just did to show that the integral is going to exist over the first portion of the interval from A up to um, C. And so kind of putting those together gives us um, a proof that if two, any two of those three integrals exist, then the third one is going to exist. And so kind of a natural corollary of that, if we take our interval A to B and we decompose that into a finite number of subintervals, say A to X sub 1, union X sub 1 to X sub 2, da 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 da, X sub N minus 1 up to B, then um, if we've got integrals existing over each one of those subintervals of f d alpha, then f is Riemann still just integrable with respect to alpha over the entire interval a to b, and we know that the that integral is going to be um, equal to the sum of the integrals of um, integrals over those subintervals, and so the proof of that is really not anything more than just an application of mathematical induction and the theorem that we just did, theorem 7.4. So now kind of moving on to our ultimate goal of kind of applying this to more general step functions. Um, let's recall uh, again what our definition of a step function is going to be. So if we've got a function, um, alpha, from um, the closed interval a, b into the real numbers, then that thing's going to be a step function if there's a partition p um, starting at the left end point, a is equal to x naught, x1, all the way up to x sub n plus 1 equal to b of the entire um, interval a to b, such that alpha is going to be constant on each one of the open subintervals from x sub k minus 1 to x sub k. And then the numbers that we have, alpha sub k being um, the difference um, between the limit as alpha approaches x sub k from the right minus the limit as alpha approaches x sub k from the left, um, those alpha sub k's um, are going to be called the jumps of alpha. And so kind of a corollary to that theorem 
um, that we just did. If we let alpha be a step function on our closed interval a to b, um, we've got a function f on the closed interval a to b into the real numbers such that not both f and alpha are going to be discontinuous from the right or left at each jump point of alpha, then f is going to be Riemann still just integrable with respect to alpha over that closed interval a, b. And in fact, that integral is going to be um, just the sum um, of the functions evaluated at each one of the jump points. So the function f evaluated each one of the jump points, um, x sub k, and um, the value of the jump, alpha sub k, at each one of those. Now kind of the proof of that theorem um, is really nothing more than our theorem 7.9 and the corollary that we just did to theorem 7.4. So you put those two together and voila we have this theorem. Now to kind of make this connection between a riemann still just integration and summations, um, let's recall the greatest integer function. Now if we write this kind of square bracket x around x, that's going to be the greatest integer less than or equal to the value of x. And that's kind of our, what we might think of as our quintessential step function. And we kind of look at the graph here. Um, and this is really what we're going to put to use in making this connection between um, riemann still just integrals and um, and our finite sums. And so what that brings us to is this theorem 7.12 from our text that every finite sum can be written as a Riemann still just integral. Um, that if we have a sum k going from 1 up to n of a, of a sub k, if we let f be a function on the closed interval 0 up to n, for which f of k is going to be a sub k um, and f is going to be continuous from the left at each k for k going from 1 up to n with f of 0 being 0 then um, our summation from k going from 1 up to n of a sub k is going to be equal to the integral from 0 up to n of f d alpha being the greatest integer function. So the Riemann still just integral of f with respect to the um, greatest integer function from 0 up to n. And what would the proof of that theorem be? Well, it pretty much follows immediately from our theorem 7.11 and the fact that the jumps in the greatest integer function are really just going to be 1 at that point. And so the, from here we've kind of um, made this jump of kind of one application of the Riemann still just integral. Um, is relating sums to um, integrations with step functions. And we also see kind of one condition that's going to be um, important when we start discussing the existence of these Riemann still just integrals, um, namely that whatever function that we're integrating with respect to both the integrand and um, the integrand f and the alpha can't be discontinuous um, from either the left or right at exactly the same time. And so that's going to be one of the big punchlines that we'll be exploring um, coming up. So stay tuned for that and I will see you all next time.